Good morning. So my drive in here was just overwhelmed with the look of the trees. You know, this year has been so hard. There's been so much stuff that has been so different. And we're all missing the fair. We're missing normalcy. And seeing the, the trees and so many colors just brought a moment of joy. Like when scripture says, the trees clap their hands with joy, this is what I picture, where the trees are so many colors, and right as the summer ends, they clap with joy. So please, with that sort of joy, wave to each other this morning. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> I have more joyful announcements to you. We got an update on the food pantry. If you remember, Trace challenged us to raise $2,000 this year. We beat it, way beat it. We are now at $2,900 for the food pantry. That is insane, so thank you so much. And the year's not even over, so kudos. And we don't even know how many pounds of food. <laughs> so much for taking this over for us and helping out with them and you know this has been a year people have needed help so thank you we may beat this uh speaking of food Hans has brought us lots of good food on the way out help yourself to green tomatoes so you can go and fry some and gourds and a little bit of red tomatoes Are there any other announcements well, please rise as you feel comfortable in doing and join me in the call to worship. In the midst of fear and anger, in the midst of mayhem and destruction, God calls us. With everything else going on, who has a sign for a feast? We're busy, we'll get around to eating and In the midst of our anxiety, our worry, in the midst of bill paying and appointments, God invites us. We are intended to visit everybody, to sandwich between errands, to snack with the meat while driving, or check an email, or working on today's big project. The feast is spread. All are welcome. All are welcome. We are invited. We are welcome. We are worthy. How will we respond? Join me in our responding hymn.
God, we are made in your image. Pour upon us the spirit of love and compassion. Enable us to receive each person as an image of you. Oh God, grant that we may always live with acceptance of each other, with love of each other, with forgiveness and encouragement of each other. Help us remember that we are one, one family with you as our God. Come this morning, God, and awaken that spirit among us. Amen. to support each other, to pray for each other, all joys and all concerns. Is there anything that you would like to share that we could pray about together? We know you hear all prayers, every single one you cherish. And so we pray today in the name of Christ, who came and taught us this specific prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to our time of tithes and offerings, where we remember that we are bringing to God and God's service a bit of all that God has given us. So please, as you feel comfortable, rise and dedicate your prayers and times and offerings to God. Thank you. Would you join me in our next hymn?
are on the back of your bulletin. The first is Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 4. To set the scene, Jesus is standing in the temple of God in the, the courtroom, courtyard outside of it, and he is surrounded by a crowd. And he's speaking for the crowd and his disciples, but he's also speaking to the temple leaders and to the religious elite around him. And he is giving a strict lecture to these religious folks. So, Matthew reads, Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it, and they went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Our next reading is Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. And Paul is continuing his letter to Philippi that we read some of last week. Of a curious note in this section, he names two women as equals to the men doing the ministry at the time. Philippians reads, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Eudora and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. These are the words about God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh God, thank you for these words. Words that pass us wisdom, words that pass us encouragement. Let them be fresh waters to us enlivening us so we can go out and spread your good news to the world. Amen. So, it's supposed to be good news, right? Today's parable unnerves me. Now, this parable is retold a couple times in the Gospels, and each of them remember it a little different. It was a little different application, a little different setting. And neither one of the Gospels is right or wrong, because parables are stories Jesus told that make us think. And when we retell them, we reflect what we were thinking about at the time. They're like 
kaleidoscopes where you can turn them again and again and get new insight? Or have you ever seen those metal fruit baskets where you can unfold them and they take new shapes every time you play with them? I had one of those as a kid and I couldn't stop messing with it. Now it's a bowl, now it's a basket. Play with these, get new insights. When Matthew heard Jesus' parable, Matthew was a several generations after Jesus' death. And he was in this situation where their, his community was getting kicked out of synagogues because they were considered no longer Jewish, because they had so many Gentiles among them. And he couldn't understand why they were not considered Jewish when they clearly were following the Jewish Messiah. And yet they had all these Greeks coming in with their own ideas of what it was to follow the Messiah. And he heard this parable, and he said, this, this speaks to us. He's heard in this how Christians were supplanting, replacing the Jews. And he thought, this is a story about the covenant God set with the Israelites. And everyone said, yes, we're with you. But when God said it's time to come to the great feast, those people, the chosen, refused. God sent them prophets, sent them Jesus, and finally said, all right, bring me anyone who will come. And so that's how we got all these Greeks, all these non-Jewish people to be showing up at what our synagogues and now our house meetings because we got kicked out of the synagogues. So that's why there's Greeks and Romans and if a non-Jewish person comes into here, they've accepted the invite, but they can't assume that they're already in heaven. They have to don on the party clothes. And for Matthew, of course, this means you've got to look like Christ, or else you'll suffer the judgment and be kicked out with everybody else. This helped Matthew. He likes the phrase, outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He uses it over and over again. And it spoke to him about why the Jewish temple was destroyed, about why he and his community were no longer welcome in the synagogues, about how to understand their community, which was now half Gentiles, half non-Jewish born, and half Jewish born people. It helped him. And it should help us today. But we are not in the same situation. We are not a minority seeking authority. We are not brand new Christians. We weren't born in polytheist communities, communities where our parents and us worship many different gods at one time. We now are the people with power. And it's religious abuse if we say Christianity is replacing Judaism. It is how Christians have come to murder Jews for centuries. And we don't want to do that. We are not the early church. We're not Matthew, and we're not the, his community. But we're the church. So we can still read this parable and hear God's wisdom out of it, even if it has a different meaning to us today than it did to Matthew. So parables are these, these stories where things start off normal and then something twists. And in that twist, we have insight. And those, that insight is from God. So let's look at this parable closely and see where it goes from normal to abnormal and see what insight that gives us about who and what God is trying to say to us, who God is and what God's trying to say. In our parable, everything begins normal. A king has a son, very normal. He sends out save the dates for his son's wedding. Very normal. When the day comes, he then uh, sends out messengers to everybody who RSVP'd and says, today's the day, remember? Come on over to the palace. Everything's ready. Come eat. But all the people that RSVP'd say no. That's kind of weird. It could happen in real life. It does look like rebellion. So the king sends more messengers out on this same day. It's a little weird, but it can happen. I mean, you want to try diplomacy before you have all-out war, right? So sends out these new messengers. 
And instead of listening to the messengers, the, pe the people who had RSVP'd flat out kill them. That is clearly a declaration of war. It's pretty unlikely, but again, we're not yet out of could happen. So the king answers their declaration of war with war. This is where we leap fully into a parable. <laughs> Because in a single day, the king wages war, the same day that he has a wedding, mind you, and he goes out and he kills all these people who had RSVP'd and burns their city. What city is that? That'd be the king's own city, because he sends it out to the nobles. So he burns his own city, and then he kills his own nobles. Last, he tells his slaves, go out into this burned city and collect everyone you can and invite them to this wedding banquet today, which somehow has not spoiled in the hours it has taken to burn the city and kill all the nobles. Can you hear how this is clearly a parable? This stuff couldn't happen in real world. There's not enough hours in the day. So, next part of this parable. The king comes in to see everybody that's been brought in off the streets, and there's someone there who doesn't have fancy clothes. So this spiteful, vindictive king binds the man up in rope and tosses him out and says, you can't be here if you don't have on fancy clothes. Now Matthew's interpretation of the king as God doesn't sit well with me when I read this. I don't want to think of God like this. I don't want a savior who is so full of spite and malice that the Savior is good for killing all these nobles and burning the city. I don't want to think God throws open heaven and invites everybody in and then goes through and throws out those who don't fit, those without the garb of Christ, those without enough good deeds to their name. No, I listen to scripture and I hear God who is merciful and who gives chance after chance. So to me, this parable needs flipped, played with like a kaleidoscope, not changing it, but just seeing what other images can appear as you keep turning it. First, the name. Normally, this is called the parable of the great feast. Well, Jesus and Matthew both did not name this parable. Monks did. Monks sometime uh, it's a thousand years after they, these parables were wrote down. <coughs> You see, when you are transcribing things, copying them from one book to another, it gets confusing sometimes. So they wrote down numbers to give things verses. That's how we got our verses. They added chapters. They added titles. They even added our punctuation because originally there was no punctuation in our scripture. All of that has been added over time to make it more accessible. But that also means it changes how we interpret what we're looking at. We can make up our own title for this. What would you call this parable? What do you think is the most important part of it? Second, what about these clothes? St. Augustine <laughs> read this at about 500 AD, and he was disturbed also. Augustine is one of our church fathers, and when he looked at this, he said, okay, if the king is God, then we have to imagine that the clothes were provided for all the guests so that when the king god comes to the person who has hasn't the wedding clothes on and says why are you in street clothes the man is speechless because he has no excuse the clothes were provided for each person to come and therefore in this parable God is justified to throw out those who refuse to live a life pleasing to God, to put on the clothes of God. It worked for St. Augustine. But for us, how do we explain the phrase, many are called, few are chosen? In the story, everyone ends up getting called. And the only one chosen is the guy who gets chosen for bad attention. And he gets chosen and thrown out. Do is, are, are we okay with saying everybody should come to God and hope God doesn't notice you? I don't think so. 
We say we are chosen. We're called by name from God. But to be chosen in the story is a bad thing. Using St. Augustine's solution that the clothes were provided, then maybe the guy doesn't have an answer. The guy is chosen because the king comes and he wants to hear why this man refused to wear the clothes. Maybe the guy is speechless if the clothes weren't provided because he doesn't want to say, you burned down your city, and so of course I don't have wedding clothes. What do you say? Why is the guy speechless? Are wedding clothes provided as St. Augustine assumes? The text doesn't say they are. Really, in my understanding of this, we have to go to what we understand of Jesus and Jesus' ministry to really begin to see where the, the tension in the story points to who God is. So we know from Jesus' ministry that he reserved his harshest words of condemnation, his harshest judgment, for people who had religious authority and used it to abuse others. He advocated all of us to share our lives and our incomes, our prayers, our hopes, our dreams, our, our sorrows. And he did miracles for the nobodies. When he was pulled in front of the political somebodies, he refused to answer their questions. He died a political and religious rebel and then rose with glory, proving that death and violence and fear are not the final words. And we know he's among us, a holy, living presence among us. We know Jesus would not abide a despot ruler, a, someone who has power and abuses it, especially for something like a party. We know this because Pontius Pilate has a party and at it kills John the Baptist. And we remember how much this affects Jesus. We know Jesus abhors strong, harming the weak. And we know from scripture that when we have seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. That means we know God abhors the strong, harming the weak. That means in this parable, the person who is strong is the king. The person who is weak is the guy that gets tossed out. It means that if Jesus is anywhere in this parable, Jesus is the man who refuses to put on the garb of that murderous king, even when that means he's risking his life. Because remember, the king just murdered like half the town. Jesus is the person rejecting the king's bounty, the king's feast, when it is offered to soothe over, you know, please forget I just ruined the whole country. He stands there without an answer, just as later he does with Pontius Pilate. And then he's tossed out into the outer darkness, where the king thinks there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This parable, if it's understood this way, still speaks to those religious leaders Jesus is addressing. They were saying that their faith is open for all there, but then, if you remember, they have destroyed the Samaritan places for worship of God and are forcing the Samaritans to come into Jerusalem to worship. They claim their faith is open to all and then toss out those who are too poor. Jesus is chastising them and saying that truly a great banquet wouldn't toss out anyone. If I were to label this parable, it would be the parable of the despot who missed Christ. To me, it's a warning for our churches and for the synagogues that Jesus knew that we have to welcome even those who don't fit what we anticipate a, a good congregation member would look like. It's a warning to individuals chastising us that God comes to us in strangers who maybe not have great clothes, who maybe don't fit 
and telling us that that is where we find Christ, chastising us not to chase after earthly glory and to find Jesus and the least among us. When we read Paul, he says, Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Be of the same mind in the Lord. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. True, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, praiseworthy, gentle, and unity. From these comes peace that surpasses understanding. I hear and hear the promise that when we refuse to honor darkness, when we refuse to give power to those who are harming the weak, we find true peace. And that even in the midst of supposed weeping and gnashing of teeth, God is there saying, thank you. Thank you for donning on the clothes of Christ and not the clothes of any earthly leader. Thank you for standing with the least. Thank you for remembering. I'm the God who gives refuge to the poor, refuge to the needy, shelter in the rainstorm and shade from the heat. It's a peace knowing that God is with us, knows how hard it is to be human, and loves us still, is not rejecting us. It's the peace of the last word that is love. That's my interpretation of this parable. I really hope you have one too, and it can be similar or completely different, because they don't nix out each other. It's the same parable. It's just different turns of the kaleidoscope to see different insights from our most loving God. Amen. Would you join me in our closing hymn? <clears throat> Rise as comfortable.
are the death shroud and swallow up death forever. God personally will wipe away our tears. God saves. God abides. God loves. So go out and rejoice in this God who never gives up on you. Amen. Yes. We forgot about this new baby. Oh, a new baby. Oh, Tell us. Jack's daughter had a little girl last oh, Monday. Oh. Good. So they're grandparents. Yay, <laughs> congratulations. Five pounds and seven ounces. Five pounds, seven ounces. What's this little girl's name? Well, I, Aria. Aria. How beautiful. Our song. Aria. Oh. <laughs> Praise God for Aria. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What great joy to go home on. Once we hit the song, I, I knew we had forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh.